Is there anything that kind of you're afraid of? You know, like, is there anything that you're, you're just afraid that you might do by accident? How many have ever almost gone into the wrong public bathroom? You got a few hands, all right? I'm not going to ask how many actually went into the wrong public bathroom, just how many at least almost went into the wrong public bathroom. I don't know if I've told you this story before, but my mom had, was in a public bathroom, and she was all done, and she was washing her hands, and this man walked into the bathroom, and he saw my mom, and he goes, oh, I'm so sorry, and he turns and he ran out. About 20 seconds later, he came back into the bathroom and said, you're in the wrong bathroom, lady. <laughs> but, you know, we all make mistakes from time to time. We do. And some can be embarrassing, like what happened to my mom. All right? And I've been in some other embarrassing situations, but I, it's just easier to share them about my mom because she's gone, and she can't get back at me for that. So. But, uh, you know, some, some, embar or some mistakes that we make might be embarrassing. Some mistakes we may make may be dangerous. I have, on numerous occasions, come into town on Colburn Street, and you know how it does that little S-turn there by McDonald's? And there's somebody coming the other way on a one-way street, you know? And I don't know why that particular spot works so well, but they must just come to that light and turn right, and there they are, okay? Some of those mistakes can happen, and they can be very costly, very dangerous. Sometimes we can misunderstand someone or misinterpret what they say. I've, I've had people misinterpret texts. Well, this is what I thought you meant. You know, when, when you're a text and, and you wonder, well, how can that be? You know, it's, it's just words on, on, a, on a screen. But what happens if we misunderstand God? If we misunderstand God, if we make the mistake that God's long-suffering with us is actually his consent in what we're doing. What if we make that mistake? Elijah made that mistake. He thought because God didn't reprimand him right away that what he was doing was okay. What he had done in, in running away from Jezebel was, was okay. And he had convinced himself of that. You know, we, we, uh, you, we look at that little slogan out there, you know, like silence gives consent. And in, and in some cases it does, all right? In, in Numbers chapter 30, I just finished reading that a little while ago in my daily Bible reading, and it talks about um, daughters making a vow. And if the father hears the daughter make the vow, he can say something and, and uh, nix the vow. But if he doesn't say anything and he's heard it, and then the, next, and then the morning comes after that, she's held to that vow. But if he, so that silence there makes consent. And, and sometimes it does, but it does not always make con consent when God doesn't say something to us right away, right away, you know? Elijah, like I said, apparently he thought that because God didn't say anything right away and he did some other things for Elijah. Remember, as, as Elijah ran away, we, we talked about that as Elijah ran away from, from Jezebel, because she gave a little note saying, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be just like these, the prophets that you killed. And Elijah ran away, and as, as he did, he, he, he uh, got, to, got to a place where he, he dropped off his, uh, his servant that was with him, and he went out further into the wilderness, and he wanted to die. You know, it, like one day he's running for his life, and the next day he just wants to die. Like, it, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. But while he was there feeling, woe is me, it is enough, Elijah said. He fell asleep under a tree, and then God sent an angel to him. Pretty cool. God sent an angel, woke him up, said, eat, and there was some food, fresh baked on, bread on the, on the coals of a fire there, and some fresh water there in a cruise, and he, and he had that, and then he went back to sleep again, and he woke him up a second time and said, you, you need to eat more because the journey is long. And it seems that because, well, God is blessing him, so it's because God is blessing him, does that make it okay what he has done? 
Elijah thought so. Elijah thought so. Was God condoning his actions? You know, it is, it is a very, very dangerous thing to assume that because God is silent as such, that what we're doing is okay. It's like we think, well, if he's not doing something and I'm not, he's not punishing me and he's not making these other things there, then obviously I have God's stamp of approval. It is dangerous to think of that. It can be illustrated by Jesus' story when he, when he told about the prodigal son. The prodigal son was able to go and was able to blow his, his entire inheritance, was able to do all kinds of wicked and vile things, and God didn't reprimand him. All right, and it, and it took a while before he, he got right down to where there was nothing left before he, he turned. I'm not going to teach on the prodigal son tonight, but there's, there's a case where God didn't stop him. Remember Judas Iscariot? Now, right now, we're, we're talking about people that, you know, we might eat classes that are not even saved here, but, but Judas Iscariot, God didn't stop him from doing what he was going to do. And Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew exactly that one of his disciples was going to betray him. He told them that at the Last Supper. One of you is going to betray me. And they'll, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Jesus knew who it was. But let's look at somebody who's clearly God calls righteous. Lot. Everybody knows I don't particularly like Lot. <laughs> but what did Lot do? He went and, 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 and he, he pitched his tent towards Sodom, the Bible says. And then he actually got into Sodom. And then he ended up being one of the leaders in the city of Sodom. And God didn't stop him from doing that. There was a couple of reminders along the way when the, uh, the, the kings came and took everybody captive and so forth, but he went right back there and God didn't stop him. And God ended up rescuing him and his wife and his two daughters and his wife didn't stay rescued for very long, but at, at any rate, did, what did it mean that God had his stamp of approval on him for what he was doing? Absolutely not. And the same goes with Elijah, I want you to take your Bibles and come with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to pick it up in verse 8, where he kind of left off last week. and says, and he arose and did eat. The angel had given him some food there again. It says, he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and he lodged there. He traveled for 40 days, and he got to this cave where he, where he was able to, to stay there, all right? And God asks him point blank here. The end of verse 9, and he says, and, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? He says to Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And Elijah began to make excuses. And we're going to look at this in a little bit better detail in, in, in a minute here. But, but he asked them that. Immediately, Elijah made excuses and, and defended his actions. Verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. I'm the only one doing what's right. Only one. And they want to kill me for it. Making excuses. A little saying goes, a poor workman only blames his tools for the job. All right? And Elijah here is, is making excuses. I'm going to show you later on what, what, what he does. Because he says this almost again, word for word, the next time God says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah has practiced this in his mind, convinced himself in his mind that what he is doing is okay, all right? But God tells him to do something here, all right? And he tells him here in the very first part of, of verse 11, he says, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. He tells him to, to go out. He's, he's in this cave, all right? Go stand outside of this cave, and he's going to show him something. God is going to give him an object lesson. I love object lessons. I do. God uses them in the Bible all the time. Jesus taught many things with object lessons. Sometimes it was a parable. Sometimes it was a, 
a, a, something that had happened in history that he, told about, that he talked about. I believe that when he talks about the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich, and the rich man dies, and Lazarus had, had all the wounds in there, I do not believe that is a parable. I think that actually happened, and, and Jesus was just reiterating something that actually happened. Because when he had the, all the parables, people don't have names in the parables. There's a certain man that had, a, had this and so forth. But here we're talking about definite people, all right? But at any rate, he, he did that in, in, in those kind of things. Sometimes he used visuals in his object lessons. He says, look at the, look at the field, ready to harvest, all right? And, and so forth. And, and he did, did some other things that people could visualize and, and the... Uh, illustrations that, that Jesus used, they could figure out in their daytime, okay, what, what was going on. If these were farmers, he'd talk about farming. If these were shepherds, he'd talk about shepherding, all right? If he was talking to, to some, another group of people, they understood what he was saying, all right? It, it would be like coming to, uh, you know, if, if Jesus was going to give an illustration to Brother Smith, for instance, all right, he may, he may talk about something to do with building or some tools or so forth so that he can relate to that, and that's what Jesus did, all right? I like object lessons, but this one here, God is going to give an object lesson. This is the a coup de grace of object lessons. This is the mammoth object lesson of all object lessons, all right? Go stand in the mouth of the cave, he tells him. And then God does something. He said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. I've been in some pretty windy situations before, but I've never seen wind strong enough to rip rocks off the side of a mountain. This was a wild wind, be loud, deafening sound. And as he's standing in the mouth of that cave, he's kind of protected because there's, you know, but is he really that protected? Is, this, is the cave going to cave in on him? It's not going to. God's going to protect him because he's, but what kind of thoughts would have gone through Elijah's mind as he's looking across and he sees these rocks coming down and the wind is blowing, all right? And then... He brought an earthquake. And I've heard from, from other, other sources where, where it, that an earthquake is one of the most terrifying things for people because all along, the most, the most secure thing you have is, is walking on the ground, right? And now the very thing that's always been secure for you all along is now moving, all right? And this great earthquake came along. Then after the earthquake, he sent a great fire. And all of these things would have been deafening. Fire is loud when it is really going. The air rushing in to it, to it and, and what's, what's happening there. And you think, well, up on these mountains here, what's, what is there to burn? <clears throat> God doesn't need fuel to burn, all right? When uh, on this same mountain, many, many years before, Moses came and Moses saw a bush. Now, the bush could burn, but it didn't. God had a fire come there, and, and, and on the this, on this same mount, on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, similar, same, same place, all right? God, could send, God sent a fire there, and, and, but it, then there was the, the fourth part here, and it was the still, <clears throat> small voice, all right? I wonder what the still, small voice said. It doesn't tell us. It's kind of like when Jesus wrote in the sand. It doesn't tell us what he wrote. It kind of interesting to know what it is, but... We don't need to know, or God would have recorded it in this book, but he did not. I could see where, <clears throat> where Elijah, excuse me, but where Elijah saw this, the great wind come first, and then the earthquake come, and then the fire come. You think, well, what's, what could happen next? And the contrast that is there, God sends that still, small voice. And this stuff was there to teach him something, all right? This was not for Elijah's entertainment, all right? This was for his correction and for his instruction. God was not done with Elijah, even though Elijah had failed. Just like God is not done with you when you fail. Just like God is not done with me when I fail, all right? 
we have a great God. And he knows we're going to fail. And Elijah, Elijah's failure was a, was a huge failure. 42 months in preparation for this thing, and then Elijah ran away and shut the whole thing down. But God was not against him there, all right? God wants us to get right. He wanted Elijah to get it right and bring him back to be useful for him. There is, we're going to look at four lessons that God was teaching through this humongous object lesson. The first lesson number one is he wanted to demonstrate God's power. God's power. All right? Nothing is as impressive as the power that, that God has in, in control of, of nature. All right? You think of it this way. When, uh, when Jesus was, was walking on the earth and he, he did many miracles, his disciples saw him do all kinds of things. His disciples saw him raise <clears throat> people from the dead. He saw him take people that were completely covered in leprosy and heal their leprosy. He saw, they, they, they saw him as he took just, just a few pieces of bread, five, five pieces of bread, five little loaves of bread and a couple of fish and fed thousands of people. Thousands of people. But, I want you to think about the reaction the disciples had when Jesus was out on the, in the boat. They were traveling across the Sea of Galilee, going to, going to the other side, and the storm came up, and Jesus is sound asleep on the, in the back of the boat, and the waves are coming into the boat, and it's being tossed all over the place, and these are experienced sailors, all right? They spent their life on this lake fishing. Many of the disciples, I think it's like seven of the disciples were actually fishermen out of the 12. But they were there, and... Um, this, this storm was there and they wake Jesus up and Jesus says, peace be still. And the sea went to an, an absolute calm. What was the disciples' reactions? What's their reaction? They said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They were dumbfounded by the fact that he can control the actual weather by just speaking into it. Just speaking to it. All right. Elijah saw six miracles here. First one is the wind coming up and then the wind stopping when God said to him, okay, we're done with the wind, object lesson. And then bring on the earthquake and then whoosh, it's done. Shaking like crazy and then whoosh, stops. And Elijah's looking around and then there's the big fire and then the fire stops. Start and stop of all of these things. Got, Elijah got to, got to see this, all right? Why did Elijah need to be impressed with God's power? Had he not seen it on Mount Carmel where God came and, and he nuked that altar, nuked that, that sacrifice, cleaned up all the rocks, the dust, the water, everything that was around there, took it all out. Somehow, Elijah had forgot that. Not that God had the power, but here he was faced with Jezebel, threatening to kill him, and he seemed to have forgotten that God has the power. He has ultimate power. He could stop Jezebel. If he wants to bring a, a great wind, he could stop her with that, or he could stop her with an earthquake. He could stop her with a fire. He could stop her with anything that he wanted to. But Elijah had somehow or other thought that God can't protect him, and that's why he ran. But Elijah, in his, in his self-justifying state, had somehow thought that God can't protect him. But you know what? God is just as great today as he was in Elijah's day. It is one thing to know about God's power in theory. It is another to know about God's power in practice. It's easy for us to say, well, you know, I, I believe God and I trust God. But when push comes to shove and the, the, the rubber meets the road or any of those other slogans you want to use, if we trust God or we don't trust God, it's easy to say. And even sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we may have, have experienced and seen where God has done something in the past and then somehow or other our silly human minds, we set that aside and, and we panic and don't trust God. That's where Elijah was. That's where Elijah was. Lesson number two, 
Lesson number one is God's all power. Lesson number two is God's power is personal. This is, as I said, the biggest, greatest object lesson ever to happen. Who was there to see it? One guy. God did all of this for one man to show one guy what had happened here. It reminds me, and I've, and I've told you this story, and I'm not going to go into great detail on the story because I, I was not long ago I told it to you, of when I was on King George Road when all the car accidents were all around me and I was running alongside that tow truck and I slipped on the ice and I slid underneath the tow truck and as the tires were just about to run over me, I came out faster than I went in the opposite direction. And I jumped up realizing God has done something here. And I looked around and said, did you see that? Nobody else saw it. You know why? God's power is personal. God may want to teach you something personally. Is God going to bring a, a, a miracle to you? Not necessarily. Not ne could he? Absolutely. But God was, God was interested in me. I don't know why. But God was interested in Elijah. I, I can see why for Elijah, but... But God did this great miracle just to show Elijah, you know what? I'm concerned about you personally. God's power seemed far away from Elijah when he got that note by that messenger that Jezebel was going to kill him, but God wasn't far away. God was right there. He was right there. God knows our personal needs. And I didn't ask Sean to, uh, I didn't give him, sometimes I'll give him a song, say, you know, can we sing this song? And I, I had to giggle when I looked at the, uh, um, the songs when we were singing, and we're going to sing His Eyes on the Sparrow because it's in my notes. His Eyes on the Sparrow, the actual verses where that song comes from. And in Luke chapter 12 and verse 6, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? These cheap little sparrows... God's concerned about these little birds. They're like the most prolific bird on the planet. You think of sparrows, they're everywhere, in every continent. Well, maybe not Antarctica, but I mean, where there's, where there's little birds, there's bird, there, there's sparrows. In verse 7 it says, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. God's concerned about you as an individual. God's concerned about us as individuals. And he was concerned about Elijah. He was concerned about me back in 1977, underneath a tow truck. He was concerned about me several other times. I've told you the story when I was in the fire, and before I hadn't done it long enough to, to be, be a firefighter long enough for things to be reflex. They were just stuff that I'd written, I heard, writ, you know, written in, this, in the tests that I had to write and so forth. And I wasn't crawling on my hands and knees as one fire was, the fire was pretty much out, but it was still all full of smoke. And it wasn't hot. You know, I know when it's hot, it, 350 degrees on the ground is cool, all right, compared to 1,500 degrees if you stand up. But it wasn't hot, so I was, I was walking into the fire like this, trying to figure, I can't see a thing, but I'm, I'm walking in, and then... I did not hear an audible voice, all right? I did not hear God say, stop, Stephen, all right? Didn't hear that. But something, somehow God told me to stop. And I, and I stopped right where I was, all right? Yeah, I'm supposed to be down on my knees, all right, yeah. So as I got down, I reached in front of me, there was no floor, Another half a step, like just, just bending down where I was, I can reach. There was nothing there. Now, there was all kinds of things to fall on that I can't see, and I'm going to just kind of fall, drop eight feet into this basement with sticks and everything pointing all over the place. Who knows what's going to happen? But God cares for me personally. He cares for you personally. You don't know when you're driving and some car has just missed you behind you, and God has protected you because God is a personal God. God's power is personal. Lesson number three, not only is his power personal, 
God's value is personal. God did all this, this huge object lesson, to rebuild one man for his service. He could have just moved on and picked somebody else. He asked him right shortly after, we're going we're to see here, where, where he says, I want you to go and, and get Elisha. And you're going to train up Elisha, and he's going to be with you. He could, he, Elisha's almost ready. He could have got him and got rid of Elijah. I mean, Elijah, you blew it. 42 months long. We, we set this all up for 42 months for this showdown on Carmel. 1,500 to 2,000 Israelites are bound down. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is the God. And you run away and shut all that down? I'm done with you. That's not God. His value is personal. When God calls one for service, he wants the one he's called. We can turn and say, God, I'm not going to do it, and God will find someone else. But God wants us to do what he asks us to do. You know, you may feel like you're done serving God. I've done this for so long, I, I, I can't do it anymore. I'm too tired, I'm too sick, I'm too whatever, and I'm not going to do this anymore. God's not done with you. God is not done with you. You think of some of these guys. When God was done with Elijah, he took Elijah out. When God was done with Enoch, he took Enoch out. Now he didn't take anybody else out like that. But when he was done with Moses, as, as Sean was sharing some things this morning in, in our circle of fellowship time, when he, when he told him, he says, that, that's it, Moses. I'm, 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 now I'm done with you. You know, and, and, and other areas, when, when God is done, that's when we're done. All right? But we need to keep serving him. Lesson number four. We've got the wind. We've got the earthquake. We've got the fire. And it says that God is not in any of those. But then there was a still small voice from God. God usually works in small ways. Now we would love to have 500 people crashing in that door, wanting to, to have the Lord as their Savior. That would be fantastic. We got in, in Peter in, in Acts chapter 2. He, that we, have, we, have, we have Pentecost happening there in the start of the church, and 3,000 people get saved in that, in the, on the first day. Wouldn't that be marvelous? We have Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes to see Cornelius, and then they, they start speaking in tongues and everything else because it was a sign that God didn't come just for the Jews. He came to the Jew first and also to the Greek, also to the Gentiles. Probably every one of us in this room is a Gentile. Praise the Lord, he didn't come just for Jews. He came for us too. All right? And he did something great there, but that's, that's not the norm. It's not the norm. You know what the norm is? John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. One man. One guy. And Jesus explains the way of salvation to one man. That's the norm. That's the norm. We look at the Gospels and Jesus' ministry here on earth. We just talked about him with, with Nicodemus. And he talks, and you know what he spent most of his time with? His 12 disciples. For three years, three and a half years, he's with his 12 disciples. But a great deal of that time that he's with the disciples, he's with three of them. Peter, James, and John. They seemed to, like when, when they went to uh, Jairus' house, to when his, his, his daughter was, was sick there, and Jesus pushed everybody else away, and it was just Peter, James, and John that were allowed to go in and see what he was doing. Because usually, God works in small ways. Can he work in big ways? Absolutely. But usually, he works in small ways. Could he work with... Uh, with the wind, with the earthquake, with the fire, he could. It was his power. But where was he? He spoke to, to, to Elijah in small ways. Elijah saw the big thing, the nuking on Carmel. He'd seen the, the, the great thing that, that God's power was to do. But you know, the rest of Elijah's ministry was working with Elisha and doing small ways. And that's the more common way, all right? We see here that after Elijah, after God has, has done these great things for, for Elijah to show him these lessons, Elijah still was arguing with God. After he showed him all those things, 
Verse 13, it says, and when, and when it was so, Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood at the entering of the cave. All right. And, um, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, what doest thou here, Elijah? Here's the second one. He says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he said, I have been, actually, do me a favor here. I'm going to read verse 14, and I want you to read verse 10. Follow along on verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Other than the word for and because being interchanged there, it's word for word what he said the first time. You know why? He's been rehearsing this in his mind. See, I'm, I'm doing what's right. This is okay. This is okay. And he's still arguing with God. And God says no. And then, he, and then God gives him some instructions as to what to do. He gives him some other direction in verse 15 down to verse 18. He says, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. He's your replacement. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. And yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. This verse 18, I think, has a dual purpose. First of all, Elisha's saying, I, even I, am the only one left. Everybody else has forsaken you. I am the only one, and they want to kill me, and there'll be nobody left. And, and, and God says, no, no. First of all, he shows him, you aren't the only one. There's Elisha. There's 7,000 people that have not bowed to Baal. It's not the millions that are there, but I want to send you to work with these 7,000 people, these sons of the prophets. We'll see them later on as, as we, we not, not tonight, but we'll see them later on, all right? And there's others that are there. First of all, he tells them that you're not the only one. But I think there's a second reason. The second reason is you aren't going to change the whole nation, okay? But you can equip those who have not bowed. You're now going to work with Elisha one-on-one -on -one and lead these 7,000 people, all right? Elisha or Elijah, rather, he kept referring back to Jezebel. When he, when he refers to, you know, those that have, have killed the prophets with the sword, that's what, it, that's what Jezebel did. Elijah is clearly afraid of Jezebel and what she's, what she's done. And Elijah keeps referring back to her, her. She was the threat. He wanted her gone. But God doesn't always work that way. He doesn't work that way. You know, I, I, I love that little passage. I'm a little bit sadistic. But I love that passage where Jezebel finally gets her end. Jehu comes into town and he looks up and there's Jezebel in the window of this tower. And there's two or three eunuchs that kind of stick their head out. And Jehu says, who's on my side? And these, these eunuchs kind of stick their head out. He says, throw her down. That's the words. And they grab her and fire her out of the, uh, this tower, and all the horses drive over her. He goes and stops at Wendy's and has, his, has lunch, all right? Okay, it wasn't Wendy's. It was Naomi's back then, all right? But uh, anyway, so there, and then, and then he says, we better go out and, and bury her because she's, you know, she is a king's daughter. And they go out, and the only things left is her skull and her feet and the palms of her hands. Everything else is gone. The dogs have eaten it and, and, and so forth. But you know when that happens? 20 years after this. 20 years after this. Elijah still has his ministry for 10 years. And then Elijah's gone. And some of these things here that, that God has told him to do, he passed on those to Elisha. Elisha was the one that, that, that anointed Haziel and anointed Jehu. But Elijah went straight to Abel Mehola, where, where this is talking about, and he gets Elisha, all right? But he didn't, get rid of, he didn't get rid of Jezebel, even though that's what Elijah wanted. Because sometimes, God knows best, always. And sometimes it's not what we think. 
Apparently, Jezebel didn't continue to chase after Elijah. I don't know why. It doesn't tell us. But this shows us that God works in this evil world. He is patient and he is long-suffering, giving many chances for people to repent. That's why God is so long-suffering. He wants people to turn back. And he gave Jezebel another 20 years. She wasted all 20 years of it. But he gave them another chance. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that should all should come to repentance. God wants His will, His perfect will, would be for everybody on this planet to come and accept Him as His Savior. That's not going to happen because people just don't bother or they just, I can do this without God or I don't believe there is a God. Blow, blows my mind how you could not believe that there is a God when you see what's, what's around us and how complicated this, this all is. It cannot have happened by chance cannot have happened by chance. I've touched on that in a couple of messages lately. But God's perfect will is that people will come to repentance. He's not willing. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that all should come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's why he came. We may seek vengeance and think, let's throw old Jezebel down right now. We may seek vengeance, but God seeks repentance. He seeks repentance. We come from the position, and we naturally do this, and it's wrong, but we come from the position that we are somehow better than they are because we've repented. And we, we'd say, oh, no, 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 we won't really do that. But yeah, we do, all right? We, we somehow think that, that, that we're better and, and that God should snuff those people out. God should snuff these, these evil leaders out. I want to see those guys get saved. That's what God wants to see those guys get saved. We come from the position that we are somehow better because we've repented. God comes from the position that they are sinners just like we are. And he wants to give them ample opportunities to turn to him just like he gave to us. Just like he gave to us. God is long-suffering. Eventually, time is up. Eventually, time is up. Jezebel ran out of time. All right? But God is long-suffering. God wants, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, He wants you to come to know Him as a Savior. He wants that. That's why He sent Jesus. All right? If you know Christ as your Savior and you are not giving Him your best, He wants that from you. Just like He wanted that from Elijah. God is powerful. Amen? God's power is personal. God's value is personal. If he can care for a silly little sparrow out there that sells for practically nothing, when they, they, would, they would catch these things and sell them, and, and I don't know, they ate them. What I know they would eat doves and stuff like that, but they, they're, they're worth, almost worthless. And not in God's eyes. He created those things. But, but Jesus says, you know what? As, as valuable as God sees these little birds because he created them, you're way more valuable than that. Jesus didn't die for them. I'm sorry to tell you, but your dog's not going to heaven if, you, if he dies, all right? It's not going to happen. But are you going to go to heaven when you die? It's a question you need to ask. Forever is a long time. And when he talked, when I talked about, when Jesus talked about Lazarus and the rich man of Lazarus, all right? The rich man was in hell back 2,000 years ago. He's still there. He's still there. You know where Lazarus is? He's still in heaven 2,000 years later. We serve a great God. He is a long-suffering God. And because he's not necessarily correcting you in what you're doing does not mean that what you're doing is what's pleasing him. What you're doing in order to please him, it has to be in accordance with, with what, he's, what he says here. If if I put it this way, if, if there's ever a time when you were closer to God than you are now, 
That should be an indicator. You're wrong. If there was ever a time when you were more desirous to serve God, more on fire to tell other people, more on, more on fire to tell those people you work with, or more on fire to tell those, those next door neighbors. When I got saved at six years old, six and a half years old, I was pumped the very next day. You know what I was doing? I was witnessing to the man who lived next door. And he told me, you're too young, kid. No, I'm not, sir. Do we still have that fervor? A lot of times I don't, and that's wrong. We need to get closer to God. If there was ever a time you were closer to God than you are right now, you're in the wrong spot. Is God going to tuck you into a cave and show you some wind and, and earthquake and fire? Probably not. But he showed it to you here. It happened because God was concerned about one man, and God is concerned about every one man, one woman, one child, one teenager that's here tonight. He loves you. Sent his son to die on the cross for each one of us. For one reason. So that we could have our sins forgiven and we could spend eternity in heaven with him. And we can please him while we're living on earth. Serving him. Giving him our very best. Are you giving him your best? Let's pray. Precious Father, thank you for your goodness.